So as for the lesson today, it is a continuation of buy truth and do not sell it. As we talk about all wicked deception, a quotation that comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But the reason for doing this is to follow our introduction. We talked about buy truth and do not sell it at a high level last time. Here, it's important to understand that there is such a thing as wicked deception. There is such a thing as a strong delusion, by which we mean it is certainly possible for every one of us to believe something that is completely wrong. And the reason for that uh, may well be a heart problem, not an intellect problem, not that you can't read or that you're not willing to read, but a heart problem. And what the scriptures tell us um, in 2 Thessalonians 2 is that there is a time when God sends a strong delusion. That's what we're looking at. When does that happen and why would he do that? That's what we're looking at. So in that chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2, at verse 9, beginning, we read, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So that's uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. And we're seeing activity of Satan, power, false signs, wonders, and all wicked deception. This stuff is brought to bear. Whom does it affect? Well, it affects those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Because they refuse to love the truth. They refused to love the truth, meaning you have a choice in the matter about whether to love the truth. Do you want the truth? Above all else, do you love truth more than you love yourself? Truth more than you love your family, your country, whatever. If you refuse to love the truth so as to be saved, then you are numbered among those who are perishing. And your lot is going to be false signs and wonders, wicked deception. Why? Because that's why, verse 11, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Now, on the one hand, you would say, I don't think that uh, God would make me sin. Well, no, he's not making you sin. You are sinning by not accepting the truth. But when you sin in that way, then God does send a strong delusion. And it's very clear. What we're getting at here is that you and I don't read hearts and we don't need to read hearts. By their fruits, you shall know them. What happens is when somebody does not love truth, they refuse the truth, they refuse the gospel, well, then this happens. A strong delusion comes. They believe this thing that is clearly not true. And they practice, they act on that thing. And that's where sins come from. And they who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness will be condemned for their actions, which proceed from their persuasion. A strong delusion that God has allowed or sent upon them because they would not love the truth. But this is the mechanism. And uh, I would say from experience in dealing with things in the church that I have been surprised on many occasions 
in the past. I'm too old to be surprised now, but in the past, I've been surprised on many occasions to find out that people believed the craziest things. <laughs> they just believed the craziest things. And, and they just went with it. And I couldn't figure out why would they go with this? How could they possibly believe this? This is so obviously not correct. Well, this 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 is telling you how. Because they don't love the truth, the strong delusion comes, and they believe what is false so that they will be condemned. Because I was thinking to myself, well, I know I've taught about this, or I know I've heard them talk about this in time past, and we didn't have issues with that. But that's not what it's about. I was thinking that this is an intellectual exercise, but that's only true when you want to know what God wants you to do. When you want to know, then you can read it and find out. But if you don't want to know, if you don't love the truth, then it doesn't matter how plain it is because you have a strong delusion. You're going to believe something that is false. And the time is coming when you will be the one who gets picked off in a faction in the church. You will believe in error. You will practice a sin that is your downfall. That's just a matter of time. And that's why the Lord said, by their fruits, you shall know them. But yeah, I had been shocked before about this, and it made me realize this is not an intellectual exercise. This is a heart matter. There is another account of a similar mechanism in Romans 1. In this case, instead of saying he sends a strong delusion, it says he gave them up or handed them over. Beginning at verse 21 of Romans, you can read about this. We speak here of the religions of man, just man-made religions, how people went astray from the real truth that is in God. It says, though they knew God, Romans 121 beginning, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for statues resembling mortal man. And even birds and animals and creeping things, if you're into the Egyptian thing. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the created thing rather than the one who created them, who is the blessed one forever. Amen. This is why God gave them up to dishonorable passions. That's very similar to what we read in 2 Thessalonians. At the, 23rd, or at the 28th verse, he also says, since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. And at 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but also they give approval to those who practice them. Which is to say, sometimes they do these things, sometimes they just give approval to others who do these things, but they're both guilt. Those are both guilt in the eyes of God. So let me go back for a bit here. Back at verse 23, we read how that they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for statues resembling mortal man. Exchanged, you know, traded there is a real glory of an immortal God. That is a real thing. But instead of worshiping this, we made things that look like us. And in some cases, you might argue they are us. 
We serve ourselves instead of what God wants us to do. And there are many forms of these images, these statues, um, whether that be the almighty dollar <laughs> or whether it literally be some kind of a statue or some kind of a, a god that somebody totes around with them in their pocket or on their neck, whatever. These are all in exchange for the real glory of the real immortal God. God made all these things. Why would we think that these things that are made are somehow divine? That's what he's coming back to. Because of this, you know, he had said earlier there without excuse, we can know things about God from the nature of creation. This is why verse 24, Romans 1 says, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. It's just like we read in 2 Thessalonians. Because we knew that there must be a God, but we sought something else. We exchanged his glory for a mortal thing because we didn't see fit to acknowledge him as God or be thankful in our hearts. Therefore, he handed us over to do things that we should not do. That's what he's saying. The lust of their hearts to impurity, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. The reason for pointing this out uh, is to talk about, if you will, that intellectual side of this, the logical side of this. Um, he gave them up to dishonorable passions. But we go over to 28. They see they did not see fit to acknowledge him. He gave them to a debased mind. Debased, meaning not on base, off base. <laughs> this is uh, to do what ought not to be done, it says. Um, there's a thing happening in the in the original text that is not clear in translation that I will tell you about now. The translations typically say shameful, committing shameful acts, and that is incorrect. They are making a mistake. It's almost the word shameful, but it's not. They're, they're very similar in Greek, but it's actually the word a schematic, meaning it does not follow the scheme. God has a scheme. God has a blueprint for how things are in this world. And they're doing things that do not fit into that blueprint, that are a schematic, do not make sense, if you will. Intellectually, you can look at that and say, oh, that's not how it works. It doesn't fit like that. This is why he calls out the practices of homosexuality in, this, in these verses, not because it's a particularly heinous thing, but because it's a good example of something that should be obvious. That doesn't work. It should be obvious. You cannot have children. You cannot be fruitful and multiply in this way. It should be obvious from nature, from the order of the universe, the scheme that holds this planet together, that that's not the thing to do. This is all that he's actually saying in Romans 1. It's not a particular diatribe against a particular uh, thing that is wrong. It's a particularly good example of something that is a schematic. It doesn't fit the scheme. There's, there's no scheme. Uh, there's no rational scientific explanation in which the, uh, such a practice would perpetuate itself. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. But people do it, and they do it all the time. It's kind of like Thessalonians, as we read before. It doesn't make sense, and it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. It's because their heart is not right that they've given themselves over to do this thing that doesn't make sense. But they think it makes sense because they're deluded, because they don't love the truth. That's the point. That's all he's saying in this chapter is, look, the, the nature... Uh, 
the testimony of nature is that God exists, that God is powerful, that he is eternal. The testimony of nature would tell you that particular activity is not acceptable, is not the thing to be doing. But people are not listening to the testimony of nature about God existing, so God allows them to not listen to the testimony of nature about other things that they shouldn't be doing. That's all that it's saying. <laughs> and again, we I'll remind you at 32 that not only do they do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Meaning, a lot of times people would not do a thing, and they'd say, well, I wouldn't do that. This is the one that gets a lot of Christians. But they give approval to those who do. <laughs> That's the one that gets a lot of Christians. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, I wouldn't do that. Okay. That's good as far as it goes. But does that mean you wouldn't advise somebody else that they should not do that either? Does that mean that you're willing to say we must not do this? This is not acceptable to God. That's what you have to do. I was surprised to find. Um, I was surprised. That, I mean, again, I shouldn't be, have been surprised, I guess. But I was surprised to find um, David Holder in Fort Worth teaching that Christians can drink alcohol. I'd never thought a non-institutional church would teach something like that openly, but they do. They accept that at Castleberry and Fort Worth. Um, but if you ask him, well, do you drink? You say, oh, no, no, I don't. Well, why not? Well, we, I've, never, I've never done that. My family doesn't do that. I wouldn't say that it's wise to engage in that. Like, okay, fine. But then when it comes down to, is it a sin? Well, I can't say that it's a sin. Oh, Interesting. Why not? The Bible says it's a sin. And that's Romans 132. He knows it's wrong. He chooses not to do it himself. And that makes it sound like he's not so bad, right? But the fact is, he gives approval to people to do it. He gives them the green light to practice this sin. That's what gets most Christians, like I say. Not that they themselves would do it, but that they make it possible for others to do it. They give them an out. They give them a teaching that allows them to practice what they want. This also is coming from a place of you don't love the truth. You have a delusion. You are given over to do things that are not right because you have refused to acknowledge God. That's where it comes from. Not that it makes sense. In 2 Corinthians, we read about the God of this world has blinded their minds. And that's an interesting thing. We started with the idea that, well, God sends them a strong delusion. Now we see that, or we have seen as well, that God gives them over to do the things that they've chosen to do. Now, the God of this world has blinded their minds, meaning Satan has a part in it as well. In chapter 2, just a couple of verses to set the stage here. He said in 15 and 16, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. There's that phrase again from 2 Thessalonians, those who are perishing. The aroma of Christ among those being saved, the aroma among those who are perishing as well, to the one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. It's the same Christ, isn't it? Yeah, it's the same God, isn't it? Right, yes. And in this case, it's the same apostles with the same message. But the same message from the same apostles, from the same God, has a different response between those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one, it smells like death. To the other, it smells like life. Well, what's the difference? Just like the parable of the sower, the seed is the same seed, the sower is the same sower. Why didn't the plants turn out the same? Because of where the seed landed, 
it's not really the parable of the sower, you know, it's the parable of the soil, and the soil is you. Second Corinthians 4, uh, at verse 3, he says, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the express image of God, the representation of God. What we claim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for his sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, which is what he just said before about him being the image of God. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. So we'll go back for just a moment here. In 2 Corinthians 4, back up to verse 3 again, we note, it's true the gospel sometimes is veiled. What's the difference? Well, for those who are perishing, the God of this world has blinded their minds. It's like what we read before. They've chosen to love error. They've taken pleasure in unrighteousness. They've chosen not to love the truth, not to accept the truth. And there comes a blindness. And they don't see the light. There is a light in the gospel of the glory of Christ, the image of God, but they don't see that. The apostles, for their part, we proclaim not ourselves. It's not about the messenger, even though they always say it is. <laughs> I told you what a terrible speaker I am, and that's true, but it's not about my ability or inability to speak. It's about the message that's being put forth, isn't it? I'm not proclaiming myself. I'm proclaiming Jesus. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts. What God said, let light shine. When did that happen? Hmm. Oh, yes, it's Genesis chapter one. Right. And God said, let there be light. Remember that? I know they told us that we can't understand Genesis 1 and that it's, um, you know, metaphorical or symbolic or mythological. Yeah, yeah, that's what they say, but I don't, you know, the Bible notwithstanding, nothing in Scripture would lead you to that conclusion. If it matters that he said, let light shine in Genesis 1, it also matters that he has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge, the glory of God, the face of Jesus. Now, it's not an unimportant matter what you think that God did in Genesis 1 and 2. That's not unimportant. The same God who said those things also gave us Jesus and has spoken and shown in our hearts, or he didn't. If you don't believe he created the world, he said he did, then why do you believe that he raised his son? Why do you believe that we have this light of knowledge? If you don't believe that, that he did what he said he did in Genesis, then you don't believe that we can know what the Bible says. Again, the treasure, though, is in jars of clay, meaning this is we are imperfect messengers, all of us are, and the medium on which it is transmitted is always imperfect. It's made of earthly things. The papyrus and the ink, <laughs> you know, are made out of dirt. The hand that wrote it was made out of dirt, as was the eye that saw it. <laughs> all of this is made out of dirt. So, too, are the lenses and our microscopes and telescopes, you understand. It's all made out of dirt, and everything we're looking at is also dirt. But somehow we use dirt to look through dirt at dirt and decide that God didn't do this. <laughs> now, that doesn't make any sense. That don't make good nonsense. Now, come on. The power to surpass belongs to God, not to us. Okay. 
it's another method of delusion is what we're saying. I will close in John 6 with the Lord's invitation for you to obey the gospel. Consider this. When we talk about buy truth and do not sell it, we have just spoken about the delusion that comes, the lie, the wicked deception that the devil uses. The fact is you and I can be deceived. When we stop letting God be first, when we stop putting the Lord first, there comes a time when we're going to believe something that doesn't make any sense. We're going to believe something that is false because the judgment will be sure and the judgment will be right. When we think about this love of truth, buying truth, not selling it, I think a lot about what happened in John 6 when Jesus taught on this matter, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, beginning at verse 56 of John 6, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me also will live because of me. And yes, feeding on his flesh and drinking his blood is hard to understand. That's a that's a metaphor. It's not literal. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died, not like manna. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And you know, even the bread that the fathers ate and died was manna. And manna, if you remember, is Hebrew for what is it? We don't even know what it is. They couldn't explain it. And yet they ate of it and died. Jesus said this bread is even better than that one that was already without explanation. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said these things in the synagogue teaching in Capernaum, which we know is where he lived. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? So people listening to Jesus teach this way didn't like it. His response to this can be summed up in verse 65. This is why I told you no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. You know, the truth is not for everyone. <laughs> you would say, well, I thought it was. Well, yes. We do wish that everyone would love the truth, that everyone would obey the truth, that everyone would become a Christian. But we also know that that's just not how it's going to be. People sometimes make a different choice than that one. We have free will, and people choose not to love the truth. Jesus is not begging them to follow him. He's not changing his message to make it more palatable. He's not using marketing techniques. He is telling them, well, that's why I told you, you can't come to me unless it's granted by the Father. Only the right kind of mindset can access Jesus. After which, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Perhaps you would think, ah, see, he learned his lesson. Next time, he'll change his message so that he can retain the people. No. No, he's not. He turns immediately to the 12. Do you want to go away too? <laughs> he's not going to change the message. No matter who believes it or who doesn't believe it, the message is the same. Do the 12 want to go? And this question is for all of us, I think. Do you want to go away too? When the going gets hard, when it you start to have to pay something to serve the Lord, is that the time to walk away? Think, oh, I'm done. I quit. I'm not doing this. No, that's not the time to leave. Peter answered him at verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? I think that's fantastic. What a fantastic answer. Lord, to whom shall we go? Is there somewhere else to go? Is there a place that the truth that has the truth that sounds the truth that teaches the truth that insists on the truth?
You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know you are the Holy One of God. So that's our call. That's our invitation to obey the gospel of Jesus. There isn't somewhere else to go. Jesus is the one place, the one author of truth. He has the words of eternal life, the words that you need to see the glory of the Father, to have the light of the gospel shine in your heart. Is this your attitude too? Lord, to whom shall we go? You see yourself as having, I mean, it's just out of the question. Uh, we, there's not another option. We're going to do what God wants us to do. I hope that you do. That's what we want. You've got to love the truth. Sometimes it's going to cost you. And I'm sorry about that. It has cost me before. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, it has cost you before. <laughs> but it's worth it. I wouldn't say there's a regret about that. I would just say, be, you know, be sure and understand. Well, there is a cost associated with this, but the cost is worth paying. Because you're talking about eternal life. And you're talking about access to things that are real, things that are legitimate, the truth of everything, the, the universe, what God says, those are the things that really matter. Those are the things that are beyond compare, that are that cannot have a price set upon them. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Today, are you a Christian, a child of God? You need to obey the gospel. We have water. We will help to obey that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Join hands with us in the service of God. If as a Christian you have not been living right, let us pray that you might start to do so. No one's above temptation. Nobody has reached a sinless perfection. We make no such claims. But we will help one another with prayer. And the church that belongs to Christ should be a safe place to say that you love God, that you love truth, to come forward, say something has not been right, to seek mercy from God, to seek prayers of intercession on your behalf to God. That's what we want to do. That's what we should be doing. If today we can help you with our prayers or we can help you to be baptized, let it be known now while we sing the song selected.